Hi, this is Jan Kabili, bringing you another exciting episode of The Fix, the podcast that's all about Photoshop, Lightroom, and post-processing. My guest on this episode is the terrific Ron Clifford. Ron Clifford is a landscape photographer, he's an artist, and he's a creative mentor who has taught thousands of people how to shoot photographs and how to process them in Lightroom and Photoshop. Today, Ron is going to share with us how he uses the adjustment brush to paint with light and color on his own photographs. Before we get into this episode, I want to remind you that we're building up a terrific library of past episodes of The Fix, and that you can go back and watch any of those you've missed at thisweekinphoto.com slash The Fix or on the TWIP YouTube channel. And if you want to catch every episode in audio format, be sure to subscribe on iTunes. To do that, go to iTunes and search for TWIP The Fix, and The Fix is all one word when you search. So now, let's talk with Ron Clifford. Hi, Ron. Hi, Jan. Ron, you know, you are such an experienced coach and mentor. You've taught thousands of people how to use Photoshop and Lightroom. I'm curious about what it is that you advise them to do when they're working in Lightroom and Photoshop. What's your biggest piece of advice? My, my biggest piece of advice, the thing closest to my heart about post-processing in general, but especially uh, as it pertains to Lightroom and Photoshop, because I call those my digital studio, it's like an art room, uh, is the, to keep in mind the idea of the word permission. If there's a word that I could leave you with, um, and, and you just you didn't listen from here on in, it was the word per permission, but of course you're going to listen. Um, I want to kind of convey the idea that not to confine yourself in a box, in a box of rules about what we ought to do and what we ought not to do, but to give yourself permission to play in this sandbox of creativity. And Photoshop and Lightroom give us this, these incredible tools to let us do that as digital artists. And so we move from just being a picture taker to a picture maker. That's a great term, a picture maker. I very much agree with you. I think that some people are afraid of the tools, though, and so they don't feel that they can play because they don't even know the basics or they don't know where to put their... If you think of photo, uh, Lightroom or Photoshop as a piano, um, before you can play and experiment on the piano, you at least have to know that, you know, what the white keys do and what the black keys do and that the very fact of pressing down on the key makes a noise and so forth. Does that register with you? It does, and the great thing about Photoshop, both Photoshop and Lightroom is that you can start as a very new beginner and learn one particular tool. Today I'm going to show, talk about and show you the adjustment brush, uh, which is my favorite tool of all, probably because I started as a painter, so it, it most feels right to me to use as a tool in Photoshop. Um, and then you can grow your skills by learning in increments until one day you look back and a few years later you're, you're an expert. You really do have a sound set of tools that you could use that you never dreamed you could. One of those ways is, and, and this is where I, I'm, I'm, you know, kind of where I met you was lynda.com uh, in a progressive, very, uh, very linear way of learning uh, along with working files. So I just want to kind of lean to you to advance your skills beyond the fundamentals. Sure, you can learn some things. There's lots of YouTube stuff out there. But it, it ends up getting to the point where you just have this big, huge, messy junk drawer of tricks instead of actually learning something progressively. And so I would strongly recommend for those who can to consider a learning platform where you can learn in steps on, on particular topics. I think the best learning happens there. But then if I understand correctly, once you get the basics down, then you think it's really important for people to give themselves permission to play. I think that's how you put it. Absolutely. Um, and as you add more tools to the toolbox, each tool you add, don't confine it to a box. Ask yourself, what other things can I do with it? Um, like, I, 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 like I said about the adjustment brush, that tool does some amazing things. And if you never went outside of the adjustment brush, there's so much you could do. If you never added plugins, if you never learned layers, if you never did all those things, you could work with the adjustment brush in Camera Raw to create some pretty fantastic art. I think that's right. Do you ever advise your students to use virtual copies in Lightroom to experiment with different looks? All the time. Um, probably one of my favorite things to do, and you'll see when, uh, for those that are viewing, you'll see when I do my screen share, you'll see that I do have some virtual copies laid out that I've, I've showed the progression of images from. And um, 
yeah, I think Lightroom is a fantastic tool that way because it gives us that ability to do virtual virtual copies. Um, I, I know there's tools in, in Photoshop. I don't use them like snapshots. Something like, is it called a snapshot in Photoshop? Here I am, I do Photoshop, and I don't know the name of it. But it's something in Photoshop similar, but it's not the same. But you do, do you also suggest using snapshots in Lightroom to keep track of, you know, you get something to a state you like, and then you want to hold on to that and experiment further? Yeah, I've never gotten into the habit of it, but I know a lot of people that love using snapshots. I think it's just all in the kind of adapting Lightroom to the way you think and work. So virtual copies have been the way I work Great. in Lightroom. You know, when I do use snapshots, and this may help some people out there too, is if I'm ever doing retouching on a portrait, because I sort of approach it as each part of the person's face I'm working on separately. Mm -hmm. So if I get the eyes the way I like them, but I haven't yet dealt with smoothing the skin or whitening the teeth. I just got the eyes the way I like them. Boom, snapshot it in Lightroom. That snapshot or that state will appear in the uh, snapshots panel in the develop module. And then I can go ahead and work on other parts and know that no matter what I do, I'm not going to loss up the eyes, right? Because I can yeah. always get back to that time <laughs> when I had the eyes right. And then, when I, then I go to the next, okay, now I'm going to work on the teeth. Now I have my eyes are good and my teeth are good. Snapshot. And I call that snapshot, you know, good eyes and good teeth. Then I go on to the next, and that way you can always back up without having to go through a million history states backing up, which can get. Yeah. What a great idea. And the other thing, too, with Lightroom is it's, it's, it's recording the, the, the instructions, like the recipe, like your cooking recipe. It's not actually changing the file, and it's not creating a monstrous big file by creating multiple layers. And so it's a really great way to work. It is. I think that Lightroom is more intuitive for a lot of people than Photoshop. But again, it is not an either or. They are complementary, as you know. Yeah. Um, I always tell people when I'm working with them creatively, I say, work with Lightroom. And when you discover that you can't do what you need to do anymore, then consider Photoshop. Lightroom does a lot. It, it really is a great and high pro highly productive tool. Um, but it doesn't do everything. And that's why there's both. They complement each other. I agree. You know, I, you've worked with so many different students. Um, I was wondering if you see things that uh, students typically stumble upon, you know, that everybody is doing the same mistake over and over or getting kind of stuck at the same, um, you know, part of their workflow. Is there something that jumps to mind like that? I would say that speaking from a creative bent, when people are beginning to explore artistically their work and they're starting to do uh, you notice a lot when they're doing composite work or they're doing portrait retouching is that there's a general lack of the understanding of how light affects an object. And so they begin to do techniques and end up flattening or, or um, altering the way the light is naturally falling on a, on a subject. And, and then it becomes immediately, it looks like a cutout or it doesn't look like it belongs or it doesn't look like it's on the ground. Probably the first thing that I notice with people who are beginning to experiment is that idea that they don't have a real comprehension of how light hits objects. And what I do recommend to a lot of students who are growing in that direction is to study that um, form, light and form in art, not so much in photography, but in art. Open up a, a book on how light affects form in, in art, and it can really go a long way to helping your work in Photoshop and in Lightroom. I think that's a fantastic idea. And that's probably why you're so good at it, because as you said, you started out as a painter, right? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I was a, a, a painter uh, all my life. I, when I was 10 years old, I knew I wanted to be an artist. It was a, an epiphany. It's just, I'm an artist from 10 years old. I remember the day it happened. And then as I went through high school, I was, I was put into a bit of a conundrum because I discovered photography. And it opened up a whole new world, and I was in love with it. But I was, I was of this opinion it wasn't real art. And, and you know, drag me behind a bus, but that's what I thought at the time. <laughs> and it, it took years for me to reconcile that and finally embrace digital art and photography as, a, as my choice, my, my chosen um, medium is, is digital art photography and using Photoshop and Lightroom as my studio. And these days, what are you uh, shooting and processing the most? What kinds of photos? It's uh, depending on the season, it's, it goes 50-50 between uh, uh, portrait work uh, contemporary and documentary portraiture, a bit of high fashion, and landscapes. I love to shoot landscapes, <clears throat> and um, I think even one of the, the images I pulled up is a floral. Um, but, uh, yeah, you'll see how I work uh, uh, kind of before and afters with landscapes and a demonstration on a floral.
do you uh, you lead lead workshops right where you do landscape shooting isn't that right yeah i do in ontario here we i'm very fortunate to live in ontario just like you're fortunate to live in colorado it's uh i have an amazing landscape in my backyard and so i do leave season lead pardon me seasonal workshops and uh in the beginning of june i have a sold out workshop where we do nature uh nature photography which includes like landscapes and sunrises as well as teaching about uh, wildflower photography and it's a very successful workshop that's the, the next one I'll be leading and I'm really looking forward to it yeah, Canada is just such a beautiful place I don't know you know I live in America um, but I did live in Canada for a couple of years when I was in grad school and I had the great opportunity to spend every summer up in the north woods there not far mm -hmm. from where you are I think Ron it is so fantastic and even to this day it remains fairly pristine yeah, yeah, I don't have to drive very far to be in real uh, wilderness. Um, uh, and I, I wish I, you know, living here, I take it for granted a bit, but the last couple of years I've really um, made use of it, and I travel a, a lot, especially in the winter. I love That's winter photography. Winter photography, but you got to dress right. <laughs> you do have to dress right. Um, and speaking of winter photography, I'm just going to throw this one out there. I, I I haven't even announced this, like my local people know. I haven't even announced it publicly, but I have had the great pleasure of being invited to be part of a Antarctic Photography Symposium teaching landscape. And uh, it's, it's going to be in November and December of this year uh, with One Ocean Expedition. So I'm part of a, a five-member... Uh, kind of classroom on a, on an icebreaker and it's going to be just an incredible incredible journey oh fantastic now can other people join you on this or it's just the five of you well there the five of us are the instructors but others can can definitely do the cruise it's an 18 day uh, symposium that goes leaves Argentina and it goes through the Falkland Islands South Georgia and then the tip of Antarctica exploring the ice and the wildlife Oh, fantastic. If people want to know more, where do they find out about it? They, I would go to the One Ocean website and look for the Antarctic Photography Symposium. And I suppose you'll have some links on your own site too, right? Yeah, I will be. Like I said, this is, I haven't been advertising it, but I'll be promoting it more, uh, probably even starting this week. I'll have links on the website. They'll, people will be able to go to right away, and I can share those with you as well later. Um, Terrific, terrific. Well, we will do that, and if um, we'll, we'll definitely put that information in the blog post on thisweekinphoto.com, The Fix, so Great. people can find out more. Yeah. That's fantastic. Well, you know, Ron, I would love it if you would share your screen and show us a little bit about some of the things we've been talking about. I'm going to go through a couple of before and afters just really quickly to, to give you the idea. First of all, for me, I, I want to communicate to you, and I'm just going to get a little bit more full screen here. I just want to communicate to you the idea that a raw file out of your camera is just that it's, it's raw. It's a file that's incomplete but contains the maximum amount of data for you to manipulate later in a post-processing program. Uh, of course we're talking about Lightroom and Photoshop but it could be in any post-processing program. And so you would, I would take an image like this from this and, and then I would move it to that. And, and so this is an idea of what I call virtual light painting. It's not done on site, it's done right in Lightroom. And so, um, again, I have this image here, and this is the before. And outdoors, you, you can only control the light so much. You can't always make the perfect image. You don't, you don't have that available to you. But if you get an image with all the information in the file, you can move it to something like that, where you focus more on the orchid and you bring out the story a little bit better. Actually, I'm going to just open up down here so I make sure I go in sequence. Uh, the other way that happens is I was in British Columbia uh, a couple of years back, and we were on the uh, UBC endowment lands, and there's some old growth forest. Actually, the tree that you see above here, you'll have to ignore that little warning, but the tree that you see here is actually growing out of this dead tree. It's not. This isn't a live trunk. This is a dead multi-century trunk where new growth is happening. And so I would take that image and I would bring it to this using the very same techniques that I'm just going to give a brief demonstration on. The same thing here, I was, I was walking down a path in, in northern Ontario and the light wasn't perfect. I had an image in my mind of what I wanted that morning and I was hoping for mist. I even looked through my camera at one point and saw my friend walking in front of me and it, this isn't a great picture but it looked like this and it gave me an idea. And so I went back to my virtual uh, studio and I created this piece of work. So the original is here, and the finished piece is here, based on that vision 
that idea that I had. So I'm bringing the idea of art into my photograph. And you know, some people, Ron, aren't uh, seeing this or just listening. So um, maybe I, I don't want to take the liberty of describing when you say it used to look like this and now it looks okay, like this. Yeah. But could you describe how you've improved it or what how it looks different now than it did when you started? This Certainly. Part? So in yeah, in talking about a raw file, it, it appears relatively flat and lifeless. It it has the the all the information in the pixels but the picture itself is very dull like you almost like you shot through gauze but it's still somewhat sharp whereas the finished product is very vibrant and dramatic with saturated colors and light that comes through that tells a, a much bigger story and so it's my job as an artist to take the the raw file that that kind of almost an underpainting like if you were if you're an artist you may know about tone ground underpaintings maybe the we can think of a raw file like that, like a tone ground underpainting. And then my job as a digital artist is to embellish it by using the tools I have to accentuate and to add to it until I see the final vision. And what you've accentuated in this particular photo, which is a photo deep in a forest of rocks and trees and the forest undergrowth, is uh, you've accentuated, it looks to me like a uh, color um, the colors are richer, um, the light is more obvious, light rays coming through the trees, and there are also uh, a more contrast in the tonal values. Would that be a fair description? That would be a fair description. There is definitely a lot of play with contrast and tonal value, going from the richest black to the lightest light, and adding in the light rays or accentuating the ones that are there to create a mystical effect. Great. And then finally, I just want to show before we move on, and the viewers won't be able to see this, but um, one of the, the pieces that I'm most proud of is a piece that I almost discarded, I almost deleted. It's a picture of two swans in the mist. It's tilted. The water's tilted. It's on, it's on a, a small lake. It's very gray, almost like a black and white image. And it was tilted, and I thought I didn't get the picture, and I was ready to hit the delete button. And something inside me said, no, let's see what I can do with this image artistically. And this was a turning point for me. And so I took this image literally from this image that you see here to this final image here, which is kind of a panoramic, um, very painterly image of the swans with beautiful, subtle colors ranging from pastel peaches and oranges to the cool blues in the shadows. So it went from almost a black and white grayish image to a, a, an almost a, a finished painting. Uh, it's really beautiful. It's it's very subtle and uh, and light, and it looks to me like you also used mm -hmm. cropping um, to change the composition. Is that right? Yes, I did, and and I do very often. Um, I don't maintain aspect ratios <laughs> uh, religiously. I encourage people to crop it the way that works best, and so I I really encourage people to experiment by uh, uh, taking off in Lightroom on the side, and I'll just uh, show that crop tools. They, they give us, we can unclick the lock button in our crop tool so that we can move the aspect ratio away from what it originally was. And I just wanted to show that there. I just unclicked the, the lock so that I could actually move my crop in any direction that I want to um, so it doesn't maintain that aspect ratio. And I encourage people to do that all the time. That's a great idea, especially for landscapes. I very much like the sort of panoramic aspect ratio that you have in this photo. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's something like, uh, you know, 16 by 9 or 16 yeah. by 10, where you have kind of a, a, a shorter but wider um, take on the scene. Yeah, and I, I do do that <clears throat> with landscape quite a bit. Even in that forest uh, scene that I had mentioned from the from the original shot, the BC forest, the, the, the final shot is, I did change the aspect ratio. I think it is 16 by 9, which is more cinematic. I, I find, um, I love shooting vertical. It's actually to a fault. A lot of my images, a lot of my best images are vertical, but I don't always bring them into demos. But when I do shoot horizontally, I very often shoot in a more panoramic or, or crop to a more panoramic, panoramic final view. I've had some landscape photographers tell me that they often shoot a wider scene than they think they might want to keep in the end, because then you can change the composition in Lightroom or in Photoshop, whereas if you don't capture enough, you can't. Do you do that? I do that. Let me, and I'll show this for the ones that are viewing this. This original image is a bit wider than the crop I wanted to finish on. I actually backed up intentionally more when I stopped at the scene and then I backed up several feet. I took the image and then later in, in, in the final crop, 
especially in taking out some of the sky, which had been a distraction. Um, when you see the final crop, it's just a little tighter at the bottom, a little tighter at the top. It hasn't taken anything off the sides, but it gives us a more direct feeling to the path. We, I think that's great. That looks so fantastic. And you mentioned a very important point about the sky. Foreground exposed properly, the sky is overexposed, too bright. You don't yeah. see detail there. And a great way to deal with that is to just crop it away instead of trying to manipulate it and making it look kind of un, unnatural. Yeah, that's you bring up a really good point. Uh, and one that I make often, very often, is that I, I all asked my, my students, what story are you trying to tell me? Because if the sky really has no interesting detail, why not make it all about the foreground and maybe just have a sliver of the sky? Go ahead and play with that. Really point your camera down, or if the sky's dramatic, don't try to show me everything. Show me a lot of sky. Turn your camera up and just leave a sliver of the horizon. To make it all about the one thing. And it makes for very powerful images. Great tip. Yeah, so um, I'm not sure how we are for time, Jen. I did want to show um, a, a, just a really short demo of how I use one particular tool almost to um, excess. And it, it's a tool that you don't need uh, a, a great deal of understanding about. And it can be used both in Camera Raw in Photoshop and here in Lightroom. Go ahead and show us. We have 10 okay. minutes or so left. Oh, great. So I'll, I'll be able to, to share a little bit of that. And then I'm going to show you how those steps that I did, just a few of the steps of using that very same brush tool and what I'm about to show you worked in creating that swan image. But first, let me switch to this image of the, uh, the orchid um, here. And I'm just going to go down here. We'll go into our develop. We are in our good. We are in a develop module. And so what I'm going to show you right now is, is, is this not every step, but the kinds of things I do to bring an image from the before, which is here, to the after, which is here. Now, this was shot outside. I just put one of my, uh, you know, you get a, a scrim that's kind of black on one side. It could be a reflector on the other side. And that's what this is. It's my big portable scrim. And I just put it behind the plant. And I, it was on, on a cloudy day. And I just shot it. And I knew later that I could do some adjustments. So let me do a really quick demo of what I'm talking about, working with primarily the adjustment brush. But the first thing I'm going to do is set my black. And literally, in this image, all I'm going to do is take my black slider down, because the original image is kind of grayish. Remember, a raw image has detail, all the detail I want, but it's a flat image. So our black is not black. It's kind of gray. So I'm going to take my black slider, and I'm going to pull it down until I get a black background. But my flower itself and petals are still rather dull. And so all I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my brush. And in the brush panel, we have a whole lot of things we can do. One of the things I do is I never work with my flow very high. I always work with it almost always below half, somewhere between 20 and 30%, so that I can build up. And I keep my feather fairly high um, so that I, I don't get a hard edge. And I never use, almost never use, auto mask. Um, sometimes people find it helpful. I find that for the technique I'm going to show you, auto mask isn't necessary. And so then I go back to all these beautiful adjustments they leave us. They, we, we can do effects with our, our, our temperature and our tint, and then most of the other settings, like exposure, contrast, highlights, and shadows. I think the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to boost up a little bit of contrast and a little bit of exposure, but I'm going to overdo it. And this is something I want to encourage you to do when we're working in Camera Raw, because we can always go back and change it, overdo it to see what you, you've painted on, and then come back and turn it down. That's a great tip. I noticed some people being sort of afraid of the sliders. And I'm like, yeah. hey, you can't hurt anything. Drag those sliders far so that you no. can really see what you're yeah. doing. Yeah, so what the first thing I'm going to do is, is I'm really going to see where it's affecting. So I want to bring some contrast and exposure to add dimension to the petals. And so... I'm just going to change the size of my, my brush to be kind of like where I want. And like I mentioned before, I'm going to use only a mouse. I'm not going to get to my Wacom tablet because I want this to be something that any big beginner, somebody who's just learning Lightroom can do this without extra plugins and without extra tools. Just your, plug, your, your mouse and your keyboard and this panel with the adjustments. So I'm just going to brush right on the image some areas I just want to accentuate or bring forward. And, and I'm just going back and forth. And because I have the flow on very slowly, I can build it up in, in, in parts. And so I'm just going on areas where I want the highlight to come forward. 
those things to come forward there are probably what this petal to come forward that flow uh, setting kind of makes the brush act like a uh, what, what is it called the spray can like uh, an airbrush yeah, an airbrush yeah yes that's right and so I'm just changing the size of my tip so that I can brush in smaller areas where I know I want this particular technique to go And For those of you who can't see, uh, Ron is painting with uh, his brush tool and just lightening parts of this beautiful iris that he's shot against a black background. Yeah, and let me just show you now, because I, I, I'm just going to quickly show you before and after, and to do that, you, you can just use the uh, the backslash key of, of what I've been doing with this. So, so it's actually going back to my, it's a virtual copy. It's not letting me show you before, so I have to do it a different way. I have to turn this off and on here. So there we go. Um, one of the things that Lightroom does is if, you, if you're working on a virtual copy, when you show before, it, it shows the original, not the, the virtual. <laughs> and so it, that's what was happening there. Um, so right now I'm turning on and off my, my panel, my um, brush panel. And you can it's see it's a little toggle, they call it the toggle switch, toggle switch yeah. at the bottom of the adjustment brush. And so you see all the things that I've just done. And now I can go back into the panel and play with these a little bit. For instance, I can add maybe a little bit of clarity to where I was brushing. And certainly I want to add a little bit of saturation. And I can play with how much contrast I've, I've been adding. And you just watch me move that. And so I'm actually not going to add contrast. I'm going to minus the contrast and up the exposure just a little to give it a painterly look. And then I can just click new and start over again. I'll double click my effect. And let's say this time I want a little more saturation, contrast, and again, maybe a bit of exposure, just to create that form where I think light should be hitting more the front of my orchid. And more of this petal here where naturally the light would be making it move forward a little bit more. Here the light would hit it a little more. And I'm being just really quick and, and kind of... Um, I would be more refined if I was doing this like for realsies, right? I just want to show you the effect. <laughs> this looks pretty real to me. This is really beautiful. And it's interesting that you're doing this all on a single adjustment brush pin. You have not even added multiple pins, and you're still getting these wonderful... Oh, you did well, actually. I did add one more pin. I hit the new button, and I added okay. a pin. So, And that's what you can do. You can add multiple pins just by hitting new and starting fresh again with a new adjustment. And uh, I would recommend doing that so that you can... Go back. If you've really messed it up, you could delete a whole pin and just start over again because <laughs> that happens sometimes. And so I'm just going to go down again and hit before and after and show you again how, how far we've come with that. And so it's giving dimension and, and a painterly look to the image. You can take this to an extreme or you can make it more subtle. And you can always go back into any one pin and you can you can go in and, and change that adjustment any way you want. Like I can just move my adjustments up and down. So don't be afraid of overdoing your adjustment and then coming back in and, and changing the effect a little bit. Just play and go ahead and experiment. Go ahead and play with highlights and shadows and just, this is how you learn. You want to play with this and, and you want to experiment with these different things you can do. Um, you might want to reduce or, or remove sharpness or reduce or enhance the noise. I'm going to reduce noise in this. This mostly looks to me like painting with light and painting with a little bit of color, but primarily painting in and taking away light from different areas of the photo. That's right. And the last thing I'll leave you with uh, on this uh, is I'm going to click a new one and it is painting with light. Here I'm just going to paint with color. I'm going to take my saturation and move it up and shift my color temperature. For example, so now I'm not changing the, the exposure. I'm just painting on this pink. I want to change the pink of the just the flower part, just the one color I'm working on, really. And I can go there and I can play with the tint of that. You can see here, mm. oh, and I can move that around. I can play with the temperature of it so I can make it cooler or warmer. You, and if you go too far, you'll know it. So I want it a little bit warmer and the saturation of it, really bring the saturation of that color up. And so that's, you know, just basically in a nutshell, how I want to encourage people to use the adjustment brush in Lightroom or Camera Raw to begin to play with light on their image and play with the, the adjustments that are made available. This is a great way to learn those adjustments and what they do in a fun way.
Fantastic, Ron. This is so uh, such a good example of the point you were making earlier when we were uh, before you were sharing your screen. We were just talking about the importance of. Um, of, of experimenting and um, using these tools as an artist would. It's not so much a matter of walking through steps of recipes and techniques. As long as you know the basics, you know that there is a brush and that you can add pins to the photo, each pin representing a different brush, and then change the parameters on that pin. Once you know those basics, then you can really act like an artist painting um, a wonderful work of art. That's right. And if I can leave you with one, one thing to really keep in mind is to keep your flow low and build it slowly rather than trying to do it all in one stroke. Fantastic. Well, I want to thank you for being with me today. It's always a pleasure. Um, I don't know if you guys know that Ron and I used to do a show together called the Photoshop show. And so every other week was it for yeah. something like two years, um, we were doing hangouts like this together. And I will tell you that Ron is a terrific artist, an amazing photographer, and a really, really nice person. Um, he is so willing and generous to share everything he knows, um, not only with students, but with friends as well. So I really appreciate it, Ron. Yeah, I, I'm glad, you know, we haven't done a show since, well, it's been several months. And um, uh, I do miss it, although it did keep us very busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's only so many hours in the day, and if, if you are someone that enjoys creating, I think you should spend as much time as you can making art and making your photographs look terrific, as you do, Ron Clifford. Yeah, I, I agree. They're my biggest piece of advice, the one that I, I just harp and harp and harp on, is just pick up your camera. Just go shoot. I don't care how you're feeling. Go shoot. You're a creative person. How you feel is not who you are. You're a creative person, and go out and shoot. Great advice. Now, before we go, I want to make sure people know where they can find your work online and your uh, whatever you're up to and where they can find out more about that. Yeah, the best place to find me is on Google+. Plus. Just uh, type in Ron Clifford. I'm the guy in the orange jaff jacket uh, at the tiller of a sailboat or at ronclifford.com. Uh, that's not hard to remember. Those are the two places that, that are best uh, to, to begin to explore uh, what I'm doing, the work that I'm, I'm putting out there, and what I have to offer. And other than your upcoming Antarctica seminar, um, what else are you involved in right now? Uh, I have a lot of irons in the fire right now. Um, as you know, um, I'm one of the, the first masters in the Arcanum, and I've had a healthy cohort of nearly 30 apprentices now for almost a year. I'm about to launch a Sphere 2 experience, one of the first Sphere 2 experiences in the Arcanum in landscape photography specifically. Uh, I'm in the middle of planning a, uh, what I hope to be a cross-Canada trip in late July, early August. And um, and I really, really hope to be at, after that trip, right away after that cross-Canada trip, going to the Photoshop show in Las Vegas. So a lot of travel this year. It, it's just full of travel. Fantastic. You know, your life is just so exciting now, Ron. I'm very happy for you. <laughs> Yeah, things have really changed in the last couple of years, and it's in large part to do to a lot of those relationships we built early on on Google+. It's true. Well, it's a pleasure to know you, and it's a pleasure to talk to you here on The Fix. Thanks, Ron Clifford. Oh, thank you, Jan. Thanks to Ron Clifford for sharing his wisdom about giving yourself permission to play in Lightroom and Photoshop when you're processing your photos and showing us one of the ways to do that by painting with light and color using Lightroom's adjustment brush. If you like this episode, you're going to love what's coming next. Don't forget to subscribe to The Fix on iTunes and to visit thisweekinphoto.com, The Fix. This is Jan Kabili. Thanks for joining me.